Welcome. Uh, welcome to the talk. So this is making the leap from Drupal shop to product company. So who here, if you can raise your hand, uh, is building a consulting company or a Drupal shop? Excellent. All right, now who here is building a product company? Raise your hand. Oh, wow. wow. You are in the right place. Yeah. <laughs> Good work. Awesome. Uh, so uh, here's my warning. We're about to cram literally 35 hours of business lecture into 35 minutes and leave plenty of time for Q&A. What could go wrong? Let's find out. Uh, so quick background. So my name is Zach Rosen. That's my email address. Shoot me an email if you have any questions or follow-ups. Uh, I'm a co-founder and the CEO of Pantheon. I am a founder of Chapter 3, a Drupal consulting company, and also co-founder of Mission Bicycle. And we'll be talking about these companies at more depth. And I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be here with Brian, who is a, uh, a Drupal guru uh, on many levels, including business. Thanks, Zach. Um, I'm Ryan Zarama from Commerce Guys. Um, I sort of started working in Drupal with Ubercart um, back around like the Drupal 5 beta days. Um, it was neither a product company or a services company, despite the fact that everybody thought we were a company. It was a project that then turned into um, Commerce Guys in 2009. Um, and uh, you know, we've, we've grown in various ways since then that we'll be discussing in this, uh, this session. Uh, but we're now sort of creating a product internally that, that can find a life of its own called Platform.sh. Um, and then, because I'm, I don't have enough to do in my life with businesses and three ch well, a third child on the way, um, I'm also building a, a product company called Bellwether that's using Drupal as an application framework to sell things that we'll talk about. I don't want to spill all the beans now. I can keep you in suspense. Um, but just as a high-level overview for what we'll be talking about, we're going to begin um, with the next slide. We'll have to figure this out. <laughs> we're we're going to begin with um, just a, a description of the business models um, that our histories represent. So between us, we have, I think, like six or seven different companies or products that we've um, contributed to or grown. Um, so we'll discuss the business models involved in those. Um, we will discuss venture capital at a very high level. You know, what is that all about? Um, what kind of a company could receive funding? And if you're not going to go the route of capital, um, how would you bootstrap a SaaS business, either on the side or as part of um, a services company that you then spin out? Um, we'll, we'll briefly cover what product development at a startup looks like, um, and then close with just a few words on kind of management 101. Um, and, and a lot of this format here is lessons that we've learned along the way. Um, it, it's less how to go and do, um, you know, this thing that we all want to do, which is make money while you're sleeping, um, and, and more about, you know, wh what are the hard knocks that, that we've taken and lessons that we've learned, and how can we inspire you to go out and build something yourself? Um, so with that, I will pass the mic back to Zach to um, take us further. So here we go. <laughs> uh, so here's a founding story. It might sound a little familiar. It was 2006, and I was hanging out with Josh and Matt, and we were 20-somethings uh, who were confused about our life. And we were getting asked repeatedly uh, as independent consultants to work on Drupal projects. And at some point, we kind of looked at each other and said, hey, do you want to start a company? So that is the grand strategy of founding Chapter 3. Uh, wasn't much to it. And that's how we got going. So uh, the company has been built kind of brick by brick ever since. Um, it's evolved a lot over the years. Uh, at the moment, it's, uh, and as of the last two years, actually, Josh, Matt, and myself have very little to do with the day-to-day -day operations of the company, almost nothing. Uh, there's a team there, uh, John and Steph, and the a management team that runs it. It's about 35 uh, employees. It's based in San Francisco. It's 100. You know, we didn't never raised any outside capital. It's all been built off of profits, um, and uh, has a great life of its own. So here's another founding quick story. So it was maybe 2008, uh, and uh, I got around San Francisco on bicycle. Uh, which was a lot of fun because the buses are not, were not very good and cars are crazy. Uh, and all my friends got around on bicycles, and none of us liked our bicycles because they were kind of not very well designed for city riding. Uh, and then, then we all went through this process of building our own bicycle, which was really fun and took about 30 hours and a ton of research and was a pain in the butt. Uh, and at that point, we started saying, why, doesn't, why isn't there a decent city bicycle? Why isn't there an awesome bi city bicycle company? 
And then we started talking about, well, maybe we could start an awesome city bicycle company. And then it was, oh, my God, we started a bicycle company. And it's been kind of like that ever since. Uh, so Mission Bicycle has been a, a bootstrapped uh, venture uh, since then. We've, I'll talk about it more in depth, but we have a little shop on Valencia Street. And it's on a very different path from uh, uh, Chapter 3 or other companies. Our, our long-term ambition, Mission Bicycle, is to build the world's best commuter bicycle for American cities, the most personal, reliable, and remarkable city bicycles available. Uh, and our, our uh, vision for the company looks a lot more like, uh, does anyone know Heath Ceramics in San Francisco? Anyone? Mm -hmm. Never heard of them. Okay. It's, it's my, one of my favorite businesses. Dirt comes in one end, and people buy really great ceramics out the other. It's a local manufacturer in San Francisco. It's been around since 1948. We would love for Mission Bicycle to be around in 50 plus years. It's a, and, and it's not a, at all a venture business. It's a uh, kind of a passion manufacturing business. So yeah, we have a little shop. Uh, we build bicycles. They're all built to order. It's really fun. It's totally different in many ways from um, software companies or consulting, uh, but also in many ways it's just the same stuff in terms of building companies. And it, it maybe it goes without saying that they're able to use Drupal to Oh, like, yeah. yeah, to drive a lot of the construction. I, I in fact, even now, Drupal uh, yeah. Commerce, in fact. Yeah, well, you know, whatever, yeah. But that wasn't my project. You guys did a fantastic <laughs> job. <laughs> um, but no, it's, it's, it's the, uh, the idea is that, you know, Drupal is enabling people to build businesses that kind of transcend just thinking about software, Mission Bicycle, in the way that it, you know, exists today. I think, I guess previously it would have been a mail order catalog. Yeah, That'd be pretty lame. <laughs> a colder by numbers where you kind of, yeah, piece it together and mail it in and get a bike, hopefully. Um, so the, the Commerce Guy story um, was similar to the story of Chapter 3, um, which was I, w I was working on Ubercart selling restaurant equipment at the same time because um, we built it for a company called Prima Supply that sold Vitaprep blenders and true refrigeration and all that stuff on the Internet. Um, and I, I just started to, to meet people in the Drupal community around DrupalCon Barcelona, ultimately met two guys, Mike and Tim, um, who decided they were just going to specialize in doing Ubercart consulting. Um, and around the time that I decided to go Drupal full-time, they said, well, hey, why don't you join us instead of you know, just working for any old Drupal shop, and let's try to build a business around Ubercart. And so we, we got together in 2009 at uh, DrupalCon DC and uh, you know, signed the whole Articles of Incorporation and kicked off this grand adventure. Um, and, and it was really uh, stressful. Um, and, and yet it, it wasn't necessarily stressful because like starting a business is stressful. We actually like made plenty of money that year, paid ourselves fine. Um, but there was this whole like shift with Ubercart turning into Drupal Commerce that happened around the same time that took a personal toll. But we stuck it out and ended up merging um, with the French team um, of AF83. They, they put on DrupalCon Paris and kind of brought their Drupal team to Commerce Guys and created a new Commerce Guys with the same brand but headquartered in Paris. Um, that then raised venture capital to both scale the services team and pursue a product roadmap um, that we would deliver services around. Um, so we, we could have continued kicking it with Ubercart and just kind of managing that conflict and building sites and whatnot as, as a small commerce guys. Um, but, but making this jump enabled us to put me full time just on building Drupal Commerce and then other people dedicated full time to creating Kickstart and so on. It, it was just a very different path. Um, and, and we were discussing this earlier that, that one of one of the challenges in raising money to like scale a services team is that with chapter three you could kind of grow the team organically so that as you had need to add developers you could hire more developers um, whereas at commerce guys it was almost like we had money and a budget that we had to in a, in a, in a forecast for revenue that we had to hit and so we're having to actually like scale to fit something that we, we said we could do you know a year and a half before so it's, it's really really challenging um, and then, we, you know, we didn't have a product roadmap to start. It wasn't until our second round of funding, really, that we, we knew we were going to build Kickstart and Platform. I think that might be the next slide. You know, Platform was the, the product that we actually sort of put venture capital behind. And it wasn't until we raised the Series B that we even were able to launch Platform. Um, and so, so it's a kind, of a kind of a roundabout path to going from being a Drupal services shop that started on Ubercart, turned into Drupal Commerce Consulting, decided then to build a couple of products. One that um, is actually, so people don't know this, but Commerce Kickstart itself is kind of revenue neutral. It, it wasn't a loss, despite the fact that we spent a lot of money to build it. It also generated revenue in its own right and continues to. 
um, not just thanks to Pantheon ref uh, affiliate fees, but also thanks to things like um, payment gateway integrations that continue to pay um, you know, affiliate referral fees and things that kickstart enabled. Um, and so, so that all happened, and then of course platform happened, and now that's kind of trying to find a life of its own in the enterprise hosting space. So um, that's, that's kind of the Commerce Guys platform story. I have one more, but first I'll pass the, the mic back to Zach, because the Pantheon story is kind of like, in, in hindsight, maybe what we should have done. Um, so, so if you haven't noticed, this is appear, uh, apparently in random order. It's actually in chronological order, yeah. which is random. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so Pantheon is on a very different path than Mission Bicycle and Chapter 3. So w one way it's different is we, we have raised uh, quite a lot of venture capital. We've raised $28 million to date. And that's for a very specific reason. Uh, it's, uh, it's because the, the goal, the mission of Pantheon is uh, it's kind of, you know, stupidly ambitious. Uh, our our long-term goal is to run 30% of the web. Uh, we currently run 0.1%. Nice. So we have 29.9% .9 to go. Uh, we're going for 1% 1, 1 in a few years. Uh, and, you know, we, the, the founding story of Pantheon was it came out of the consulting work we were doing at Chapter 3 at the time. And it was really Josh, Matt, David, and myself, uh, you know, kind of idly talking about uh, you know, it, it was really uh, a realization that we had that we thought that the demands for website customers, so marketers and business owners, what they demand of Drupal or the demand of their website when they buy a Drupal website uh, uh, was increasingly going to look like what they get from software as a service companies. So Twitter, Salesforce, Google Apps, where there's no servers, there's no kind of... Um, Assertion and fix things. Think like the website really should just work is is the expectation we think marketers are going to uh, increasingly expect as they get kind of uh, used to software as a service tools in in the rest of their portfolio of tool sets. Uh, and and we basically uh, at that point when we we had that realization, we looked to to where the state of the art for the industry was for infrastructure for Drupal. And we became pretty convinced that hosting companies and hosting architecture wasn't going to get Drupal there quick enough. It just, we, we didn't, you know, what we saw was a need for, for example, we thought running Drupal sites should look much more like Heroku or Google App Engine and not like GoDaddy. Sorry, GoDaddy. Mm -hmm. uh, or, and, and we thought every developer needs, like, really good developer tools with version control and dev test live environments and all this stuff that you kind of need for every site. And hosting companies really weren't getting, getting it done. So that, that was the beginning of Pantheon. And to, to try to achieve something on that scale, we, we, there was no choice for us. We needed venture capital. You know, we, we bootstrapped the company as far as we could um, out of Chapter 3. It got us decently far. Uh, but at some point, I mean, we, we've invested over $10 million just in the technology alone. Uh, and that's something we literally could not do as a bootstrapped company. And, we, we, uh, and, it, and it also works out that the kind of things we're trying to do with Pantheon, which are, is a big long-term technology bet, is exactly the kind of thing that venture capital, tech venture capital, is built to do. So there's a really good alignment between the expectations and uh, the kind of framework of, of venture tech investment and what we're trying to do at Pantheon. That's why we're on the path. But it's a completely different path than, than Mission Bicycle or Chapter 3, where it's, it's all bootstrapped or friends and family. And, and so there was like a point at which you made like a clean break, yeah. essentially, to, to be full-time focused on this one thing. And, yeah. yeah. So we spun, and I'll talk about this a bit more, we spun yeah. Pantheon out of Chapter 3 as a completely different company with different ownership, and uh, investors in basically insisted that we would do that. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, your, your valuation is tied negatively right. to this like services revenue yeah. that's you know, clouding the picture. And yeah. Yeah. So, so one quick story, and it's not my story. It's Drew Gordon's story uh, and Ronan's story. Um, it's the back of the Migrate No Scroll story. So I just want to call this out because it's uh, actually, I love this story. So, so you know, uh, Ronan has been working on Back of Migrate for eight years. Back of Migrate is used by 300,000 Drupal sites. It's kind of the de facto way you create backups and uh, migrate your backup of your Drupal site somewhere else. And then uh, Drew and Ronan, without any outside investment, bootstrap the Snow Scroll business into a very uh, successful and, uh, you know, very nicely operating business on their own with no outside investment. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, did this out of the Drupal ecosystem. And we, we, um, uh, 
He has a really, it's a really cute squirrel, and he's wearing a really cool <laughs> T-shirt. And we just, uh, so Pantheon recently acquired Node Squirrel, so Drew and Ronan are joining the team. Uh, but I thought their story was worth telling because I think it's um, very applicable to a lot of folks here in the room. Yeah, and, and it kind of demonstrates that it is possible to take a Drupal module and provide a value-added service on top exactly. of this this open source code um, that then not only becomes like a stand like a, a, a good business in its own right, but something that there is an exit for. There are companies that are interested in acquiring things that do that um, for various reasons, I'm sure. Um, you know, it made good sense for a number of reasons for Pantheon to, to move this direction. Um, yeah, so quick pl quick plug. So the reason we did this, we're very excited about, is <laughs> this guy's now free. Um, so, you know, Node Scroll is now a free service. Anyone can use it. And it was this thing that we wanted to do we, and Drew and Ronan wanted to do, but we could only do it together, and that's why we ended up merging. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so I, I, I'm pretty convinced there are other opportunities like this out there, right? It's, backup and migrate isn't the only thing that could have a value-added yeah. service that's built on top of open source code, whether it's, I mean, we, we've batted around ideas around administration and analytics and other things in the commerce space, but I'm sure there are, there are other opportunities like that. And, and another, another um, model that uses um, Drupal and, and uh, like Drupal itself as the heart of a product is, is this model that I first learned about through a company called BioRaft. Has anybody heard of that company? They're, they're up in New England. Has anybody he here from BioRaft? Okay. That would be would have been cool, I guess. Um, but um, I, I first heard about them, I think it was in Barcelona they were there because they were using Drupal as um, like the, the framework for their software as a service product, which sells um, tools, essentially SaaS tools, to research laboratories so that anytime somebody has a need for some different type of research, they could create a module you know, to track all of your mice in your lab. Um, and then they would roll that you know, module out to all of their other customers for free. So you're paying a subscription fee. And then sort of using this inherent like, modular nature of Drupal um, to, to roll out continuous improvements in your service to all of your customers. Pretty cool. And, and it also kind of sounds a bit like where Drupal distributions come into play. Um, where you know, typically the distribution, I think, is built as a project on Drupal.org to help other people build websites. But it could just as easily be managed internally as, as like the, the framework around which you build a SaaS company. And so that's what I'm doing now with Bellwether. I actually had a friend who developed, and this is kind of out in the weeds, so I'll be really fast with it. Um, but he developed a new model for what's called weather normalization. Um, it's part of the energy forecasting process that every power company in the world has to do on an annual and at a micro level on a daily basis. And um, he, he had this model, and it was basically like in his head and in an Excel spreadsheet. And so I said, well, I, I know how to help you productize this. You know, um, let's, let's create a Drupal distribution that can serve as a front end for a better statistical computing environment than Excel, which is called R, another open source tool. And then we can provide utilities access to this portal. And then as utilities have different needs, we can build new products for them and release them to all of the other customers so that they can quickly turn on and start to make use of all these tools. So in a sense, we're doing the BioRaft thing, but for the energy industry um, to, to start to build this sort of cloud of machine learning tools that help them better understand um, weather's impact on energy demand and, and various other things that they're doing. Um, and so this is pretty exciting that the, the model thus far um, has been what you call customer-funded development. Um, so the idea being, you know, that there, there are people who wanted this to happen and were willing to pay money for it sight unseen. Um, the minimum viable product was literally just a PDF that we emailed. And now we're finally getting the web portal up for them to make use of that. Um, and then we've discovered new tools along the way um, to then get, you know, thousands of dollars in annual revenue before ever really um, having something that looks good. <laughs> and so I'll, I'll talk a bit more about, like, what that bootstrap process has been like. But it's, it's uh, a model of customer-funded development that now is kind of at a place where it could reasonably raise I mean, at least a, a nice seed round of venture capital. Yeah, so uh, I just want to wrap up this section really quick because this was a random walk of chronological yeah. history. So just to wrap it up a little bit. So I guess the, the, the message here is there is no one right way, mm -hmm. right? There are toolkits and strategies and uh, practices that you can take from one business to the other, but there's no one right way of financing or building a company strategy or building a company at all. Yeah. Uh, and in all these companies, we, we kind of found our own way that was right for that company and made many mistakes along the way that we were you know, worked from. Yeah, and we will continue to make those mistakes. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, so venture capital, what's that all about? <laughs> this is a three-minute talk on venture capital. Uh, so 
a uh, couple messages here. So one of them is, and this is a very hard point for me at first, and I think for many people to kind of get their head around uh, in terms of venture capital. So rational people would think if you went to a venture investor and said, you know, hey, venture investor, I have this foolproof plan to take $20 and reliably turn it into, sorry, $10 and reliably turn it into $20, and it's never, it's not going to fail, and I've proven that it works, and it's a, this, like, money-growing machine, will you finance me, that they would say, well, that sounds interesting. Actually, turns out not to be the case. Those kind of businesses are not the kind of businesses venture investors look for. Because it turns out venture investment is what, what they call a hits business. It actually has a lot in common with um, uh, movies or inter entertainment where you have, uh, as a venture investor, the way this really works is you have a portfolio of many investments. Sometimes it's dozens, sometimes it's hundreds. And you're looking for the outliers that really blow up. So like the, the Googles or the Ubers or the Twitters, the Facebooks, where they have humongous outside returns, where they can turn $10 into potentially $1,000 or $10,000. Uh, but what that means is most companies actually don't make it. Most companies are not the outlier. And so what they're looking for is these big outlier companies that make so much money that they'll pay for all of the risk that they took on everyone else that didn't make it. Very hard to get your head around this. Uh, and so what it actually means, we'll talk about this a bit more, is most businesses actually are not really a fit for venture capital because the kind of risk they, as a venture investor they want you to take, you probably are not, you, it doesn't make rational sense for you to take for your business or your business is really not set up to try to be a moonshot. So, you know, all the companies we, we ran through, I think three of them are venture investment and the other four aren't. Uh, so, uh, and 99% and of businesses are not venture investment for, uh, venture investment companies for this reason. So how do people build businesses if they're not raising venture investment? Well, again, 99% of businesses, many of these businesses are, are Fortune 500s or huge companies went and built, you know, built huge companies without any venture investment. How'd they do it? Well, how about, uh, building and growing your company on profit? Uh, getting bank loans. Uh, some, sometimes people raise you know, friends and family investment, not from professional investors, but from um, you know, their own networks. This is the way most businesses actually are, are scaled. Um, and it's appropriate, actually, I think, for most businesses and business models to, to leverage these tools. Okay, but if you uh, do think you have a venture capital kind of business, there's, and, and, uh, and you don't want to do this the normal way, um, you want to do this the uh, go for broke venture capital way. Um, the good news is that, that there are a ton of resources. So there is this great blog that I love called Venture Hacks that has you know, 20 or 30 posts, which will run you through everything you probably need to think about with, but before you just start down this road. There's this really great book, Venture Deals, um, that is everything you need to know about actually signing uh, up for, for venture capital and negotiating a term sheet with a venture investor. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there are really great incubators like Techstars and Y Combinator that are literally like boot, boot camps for how to start a venture-backed uh, company. There are, there are many more resources also in addition to this. There's a lot of stuff on the Internet. And, and you know, for, for me, with, um, like, my development, I, I guess, from Commerce Guys until now, has it all been about, like, uh, running while, like, trying to start running while moving, I guess? How, how does that well, – there, there's, there's an idiom there that I'm missing. Um, anyways, trying to find my feet. Whatever, uh, and so uh, all along the way, even just doing UberCard and, and Drupal Commerce consulting, like reading these blogs and reading these books, it was just sort of like preparation, putting my head in the right, like the right space, so that when an opportunity like a bellwether came along, like it, it, it didn't take me much effort to tell my friend, well, here's how you need to grow this business. Um, so, so it's kind of like if, if you have an idea that you want to do this someday, like reading now is certainly not going to hurt you. Um, and and these, are the, these are the resources that have, have really helped me as well as, as Zach. And I, I threw um, a link there to Paul Graham's blog as well. And you can just kind of like go read everything he's ever written and, and be in a really good spot um, to, to avoid some pretty common mistakes um, whenever you start to build your product business. Yeah. All right. So, but we're, all, we're also here to talk about making the leap from an existing consulting company to a product company. Uh, which is uh, uh, the approach that we took uh, to start Mission Bicycle and Pantheon, actually. And it's an approach that's actually not available to many people. So for many folks out there who want to start a product company or want to start a venture-backed uh, product company, 
Um, they have to look at a life decision like quitting their job, um, going on zero income, having no resources to start with, and literally building everything from scratch. But if you're in this room and you're looking to start a product company, you already have a consulting company, uh, that actually can be used as a vehicle, as kind of a cheat or an accelerator to start to build your company, uh, your, your product company. And that, that is the path that we took with both Mission Bicycle and, and, and Pantheon. So uh, funny story, uh, this is actually the Chapter 3 office in San Francisco. Um, the first 10 Mission Bicycles were built in the conference room of Chapter 3. Um, which was a great way to save money and made no sense to our clients. Um, so we found creative ways to explain that. Uh, and in fact, the first year, Mission Bicycle actually got started as a web e-commerce business with no storefront. So we literally incubated it inside the office of Chapter 3. We built the website with the Chapter 3 web website development team. Uh, we put uh, the first uh, couple hundred thousand dollars of investment to get the business going. It directly came out of profits from Chapter 3. So we actually were, you know, Chapter 3 was the incubator for the Mission Bicycle company and really got it off the ground. And if we were to uh, go back in time and think about starting Mission Bicycle without Chapter 3, I don't think we could have done it. Um, or if we, we were to try to do it, it would have been a lot harder. So we actually, that, that worked really well in, in, in most respects, and so we actually did that model again for Pantheon. So the first uh, nine months uh, of Pantheon were, uh, uh, Pantheon was incubated inside Chapter 3. So this is before we raised venture investment. You know, David Strauss ended up moving out to San Francisco. He worked with us in this Chapter 3 office. We put uh, the Pantheon team behind closed doors. They were glass doors. You could see through them. It was very ineffective. Uh, we tried our best. Uh, funny story, the first two employees of Pantheon were not the founders. They were actually Chapter 3 employees who we put on developing uh, Pantheon while we kind of extricated ourselves from operating the Chapter 3 business. Again, the first couple hundred thousand dollars of investment into Pantheon came uh, from Chapter 3 profits. And we were able to get the, the Pantheon business really going with first customers and early prototype of our product without any outside in investment. And when we raised outside investment, we were pretty far down the path. Uh, and we, we uh, had enough runway uh, to really know exactly what we wanted to do as a business, which really helped us uh, when, it, when it came time to raise money. And you've said it a couple of times now that it, you, know, you invested hundreds of thousands of dollars into these two separate businesses. And I think you know, w one of the takeaways from that is that we, we probably have to like, up our game a little bit in how we're running our Drupal shops. Um, it, it seems counterintuitive. If you want to build a product business and you want to bootstrap it and spin it out of your Drupal shop, then you, you may need to learn how to grow a business first that can have hundreds of thousands of dollars of profits to then incubate and spin out a, a side project. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really good point. And I think if you're, if you're in this mid-transition, actually, it's a really hard, um, it's a very tricky place to be because you're always rationalizing your time. Uh, and so, for example, at Pantheon, it was more, made more sense for Josh, Matt, and myself actually to work on Chapter 3 and have employees work on Pantheon to make mm -hmm. Chapter 3 profitable enough to, to build the business. Um, and over time, uh, figure out how to build it. You know, uh, we, you know we, we had a team that from the bottoms up came, kind of took over the responsibilities that the founders and partners had within the next year, year or two. But yeah, just in general, so if, if you were to go down this path, it, 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 uh, it can work really well. It's certainly not easy, uh, but to, you know, to, to just you know, uh, be pretty blunt, uh, what I consider kind of a healthy growing consulting company should be able to run at about 20% gross margins. That's generally the target. Uh, that's very hard to do. Uh, and uh, if you're doing that, like, wow, that's really impressive. Uh, but if you can do that, yeah, it's, it's very real money you can put into mm -hmm. to building a business. Uh, and, and, it, and it can part of the Part of the exercise in our budgeting process was you know, figuring out exactly how much of our gross margin we could allocate toward platform.sh development and then basically managing to that number. Obviously, it would be great to exceed it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that, that was that was what we had to show the investors to bring them to the table, you know, to invest in the sort of combined commerce guys thing. Yeah. So oh yeah. So yeah. skip skip the slide. So th so then we ended up spinning out Mission Bicycle. So Mission Bicycle became its own company. Uh, we raised a, basically the, the equivalent of like a restaurant kind of friends and family investment. It's like uh, not a huge amount of money, not from any professional investors. Uh, and then Pantheon, we ended up raising money from venture venture capital groups and, and uh, spinning out in its own office. Okay, so I'm gonna hand it back to Ryan. All right. <laughs> um, so, so another way to bootstrap it is just to not sleep, um, <laughs> to work to work a full time job, and then assist your friend on your vacation days and nights and weekends um, with a very forgiving wife. <laughs> um, 
but with, with Bellwether, it's, it's literally bootstrapped on Twitter, bootstrap, um, and again, was born out of um, an existing need um, that my friend had discovered in the company he worked at. So he was from a power company developing this model um, that, that sort of far exceeded um, the, the precision of the existing like industry standard model. Um, because I guess he had discovered that the industry had sort of just thrown up their hands at good enough with respect to understanding weather's impact on load. Um, but it's coming back around again, of course, because of alternative energy and so on and so forth. And so, so he discovered this need, created a solution, sold it to his CFO all the way down, um, so they standardized on his model. And then, you know, whenever like they started to talk about, well, maybe other companies might be interested in this. Um, you know, th th that sort of, you know, he, he knew he had something special that was worthwhile to, to take and build. Um, and so, so bootstrapping meant he quit his job um, and lived on just his wife's income, um, which I think runs out soon. Um, and uh, uh, I assisted, and then we just started to, to try to, to find sales with a third friend who just started cold calling every utility company we could think of. And, um, and ultimately, like, there was, there was, like, this problem that we knew we wanted to solve. We had a solution that was good for it. It just looked like R scripts and command line output that we formatted into reports for companies. Um, but we never actually, we have, I haven't actually yet sold that thing. Um, so instead, there were these, these other conversations with customers where they said, well, we, we don't really need to, to um, apply your model to sales forecasting right now, but I do have this, like, maintenance issue where I need to understand weather's impact on number of customers without power per hour. Okay, so the same model can help them understand that and produce them a pretty report that they're willing to pay thousands of dollars for. And then there's um, just the tool that's even simpler. You know, it, it was um, a, a better weather forecast because the, you know, the company with 80% market share in the, the forecast data supply space um, literally gives you access to an FTP server to download your file and you're forced to then customize that, reformat it, and distribute it amongst your team. And of course, with Drupal, we can quickly create a user interface that somebody can log into and download reports. And so, so it's, it's a really scrappy story, right, where we, we, we knew a market um, and we knew people had problems that weren't being addressed. And so then it was, okay, how, how can we use the tools that we have in the very limited time that we have to, to, to begin to address their needs and get money, like, coming through the door? And so, like, this was a weekend project, literally, um, to create the prototype for them to, to get their weather reports. But they're happy to pay $6,000 a year to have access to this site. Um, and, and, you know, who knows what other opportunities there are. And so the basic framework here for... Um, creating a product and bootstrapping this business is that you have to have a problem worth solving that you've identified in a market that hopefully you know well. So whether that's everybody should have automated backups of their Drupal sites or power companies shouldn't have to FTP CSVs off of servers and reformat them and distribute them. There, there are problems out there that you can find and solve. So then you have to iterate your way toward a solution that actually addresses um, real customers' needs. So that's what's, co that's what's called finding your problem solution fit. It's the idea that, that the solution you think is going to solve somebody's problem, a Pantheon agency dashboard um, or, you know, a command line interface for platform, whatever it is, um, actually does solve people's problems and is usable. Then once you have this thing and people are paying you for it, you now have a product that you're testing in the market, pricing, you know, determining how to support it, et cetera, et cetera. That's called finding your product market fit. Then once you've done that, well, you can scale it. Happy day. It's, it's, it's now a matter of creating this, this sales and marketing engine um, that, can, that can take this idea and scale it. And so the idea behind bootstrapping is like that you're, you're not necessarily saying no to money, um, but you're saying when. You're saying that, it, that it's, it's better um, to find some outside investor who's interested in multiplying their money at a time when you have a model that's ready to be multiplied. Um, so for all of the businesses that we've been involved with, whether it's building bicycles and knowing that this is something that people are going to pay money for and, um, and then, then it can scale, or building website platforms or e-commerce frameworks or um, you know, tools for power companies, you find where it can scale and then that's a great time then to raise that friends and family round if you want to take it to the next level or in the case of Bellwether, begin to talk with um, you know, early stage investors to put together a round that can help you accelerate specifically that sales and marketing and not you know, see you continue to, to pour money into building the product that you haven't tested yet. And so I, like, everybody's story is different and unique and you, you learn lessons every time you do it. But with, with Commerce Guys, we sort of lived at this point of tension for a long time where you had two businesses that, that we raised money to build in one 
um, which meant that the services company needed to grow and scale, but it also needed to supply money to um, the platform.sh team and company. And so there's this, there's this real tension um, that, that kind of came maybe from, from a, a bit of premature, um, premature like, scaling, like there was no real product yet at the time. So I'm, I'm sure we could analyze it. But, but the big idea is that you know, it, it was a longer path toward finding that product market fit. And now we're going to have to separate on the tail end the two businesses and distinguish them so that we can scale them both on their own terms. That, so it's, it's just you, you can either go, I guess, one way or the other or one of a hundred different ways. Um, but at the end of the day, you're still having to follow the same basic pattern to grow and scale a product company. Um, and there are tools that help you do this. Um, probably the best tool that um, we used um, just to, to help my friend sort of think about how to productize a data model or an algorithm was what's called a lean canvas. And it just forces you to put down on one sheet of paper, you know, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? What is your solution? Um, how do you evaluate your solution's effectiveness? What's your unfair advantage? Who are your customers? How are you going to reach them? What's your revenue model, et cetera, et cetera? And it's all on one piece of paper um, so that you can really quickly, you know, one, like, like just make sure you understand what you're trying to do together as a business, but also use that then to speak to potential investors if that's the route you're going. Um, and I think that, um, you know, Zach, you've thrown some books on there that would be also helpful. Yeah, so I just want to reiterate that. So uh, right when we were starting Pantheon, we were, uh, well, three of us were very good engineers. One of us was a faker, me. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the impulse was, let's start coding. We know what to build. Let's start building it. Oh, I love building things. But instead, we forced ourselves to go through this lean startup process. We literally bought this workbook, which is not a very well-produced workbook, which was really like do the lean uh, you know, pro customer development process step by step by step, like paint yeah. by numbers. And we did that, and it was one of the best things we ever did because it saved us literally thousands of hours of lost effort building product that no one would have wanted. Uh, it's, it's just all about, I mean, you should never write code before you do this process. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm such a believer in this at this point because yeah. the biggest mistakes you will make is just building stuff that people won't find valuable. I, th I think uh, w one of the things that really blew my mind about the Lean Startup and running Lean and other books like that is that the MVP is like uh, a wireframe. You know, it's, it's not, oh, I've, I've now built my Drupal distribution and I can go and install it and demo it to somebody. It's, it's literally just, well, what if we did like something like this? Would that be interesting to you? And that, it's just enough to get you to the next iteration of testing your hypothesis until you finally know what you're going to build. So. Yep. Yeah. All right. So we're continuing our tour of uh, business <laughs> lectures. We're on hour 29. Uh, okay, Management 101. Uh, so this is uh, li my little spiel on co-founder relationships and building co-founding teams. But I really think applies to just building teams in general and specifically early teams. So, and I'm totally stealing this. This is an, I think there's an old Steve Jobs quote where he, you know, it's, it's, the, the best model of building teams is the Beatles. So here's why this example, I love this example. So the Beatles were, you know, the best band arguably of the last, whatever, 100 years. Um, you can argue that point, but phenomenal band. Uh, but as individual solo acts, not that fun. I mean, pretty good, but not like, you know, earth shaking. And it just turns out that, you know, these uh, four gentlemen as individuals were, you know, okay, musicians, like pretty good musicians. Um, but the things that they were individually really good at, they were really good at, and the things that they were not good at, someone else in the band covered up. And as a group, they were able, it was really an example of four individuals performing much better um, than one plus one plus one plus one. Um, they, uh, as a group, um, uh, were, were uh, you know, a, a phenomenal act. And I think they apply the same thing with co-founders. Like the best kind of co-founder relationships you would think would be like, oh, I like you, you like me, we're really good friends, we're both awesome at the same thing. <laughs> um, which the, the problem with that is the jobs you need to do at a startup cover so many degrees of operation that what that usually leads to is, you know, the things that you're best at, you're both trying to do the, the, the same thing, and then all this other stuff just gets kind of ignored. I think the best kind of co-founder relationships are the ones where you're just totally different. I mean, you like each other, you work really well, but you're just really good at different stuff. So the things that you love to do, you can love to do. The things that you hate to do, your co-founder is amazing at. That's a great co-founder relationship. And where the things that you're really are just kind of not good at, someone else is covering your, your weakness. Um, and I think that's, you know, that, that is my kind of mantra for, for team building and, and certainly applies in co-founder relationships. Thanks. And, uh, you know, 
uh, I, before I before I speak to this slide, I might actually add to the uh, the team uh, the team slide is that um, there, there's something to be said for like equal levels of motivation and like interest in the thing you're building, and like if if one person's interest really wanes, like it's it's really time to kick them out of the band. And, and replace them with somebody that is interested in making these. Because we we um, we just experienced this at Commerce, guys. Where my two original founders, um, you know, Mike and Tim, are no longer at the business, and and it was really a case of um, you know one person's interest just wasn't like his heart wasn't in the business because he didn't know what to do or how to contribute, and ultimately just needed to needed to move on. Um, and then you know the, the other partner like. The, I, this maybe had as much to do with the distributed nature of our business as anything else, but like just the relationship wasn't working and his interest again, like, ah, you know, I'm, I'm having to do sales. I'm not really interested in just like doing sales. So maybe I'll just go and build a product somewhere else. You know, like, like know, knowing ahead of time what your levels of interest are and, and keeping, like, keeping really close tabs on that and, and being able to like ask that, like, is your head still in the game? And if not, like, it's cool. Like, we just need to plan for the health of the business, not for, you know, dragging you along somewhere you don't want to be. Um, and I, I guess maybe part of the way to, to make sure that you all stay aligned is to have that, like, shared um, vision for what you're doing together. And then also to, to approach it from, like, a, a shared set of values. And um, one of the things that strikes me about Zach and his um, presentation of his businesses is that, you know, first with Pantheon, you know, you know the mission of Pantheon is to power, or the vision is to power 30% of the web. Um, and that's, that's something that can really drive their business decisions. Now they can acquire a node squirrel because they know that that's going to get them further toward powering 30% of the web. They can expand into WordPress because that's going to get them closer to powering 30% of the web. Um, and I, th I really think you were the first Drupal, like, you know, company, like platform hosting company, whatever, to, to go that direction. Um, and, it, and it's because it does align perfectly with their vision. And, and if there was something that wouldn't get them toward that vision, I think they would say no to it because they have, what, you know, this north star that Zach calls it, guiding them toward um, a specific point together. Um, the other thing was, you know, values are, are really important. And so um, with, with Mission Bicycle, the values that you guys shared were to have personal, remarkable, reliable city bikes, you know, the best ones in the world. And, you know, that turned into what seems to be a really great business and fantastic looking bicycles that I assume are also personal and remarkable and reliable. Um, and so there's, there's this real need if you're trying to set out to do something different and something new and something together with other people, which I, I, I also recommend. It's, it's difficult, so doing it with a team um, is, is kind of statistically proven to be more successful than doing it on your own. Um, but to, to, to talk up front about this, this vision and values is, is really, really critical to the long-term health and success of the business. And you're not going to want to have to try to figure that out retroactively as you're already moving somewhere, um, especially if you're doing it from within the context of like a services company and trying to, to, to bootstrap something and spin it out. Like, like literally the only way to change the culture of a services company is to like change all the people in it. Um, and even then, you're still the same person, and so you're probably going to end up with the same culture or similar to what you had created before. So ha having this set in advance is, is um, really key to any kind of company, but certainly to you know, a product business that has a very long game in mind and, and can be very stressful and involve fundraising and really weird incentives and perverse incentives. Anyways, so that's, that's my, uh, my management bone to pick is, is really leading from values is the only way you're going to make it happen. Um, especially because there are so many distractions. There's so many things that, that, that we could do with this whole bellwether idea, needs that we could meet that would just be a distraction or people we could partner with. I think um, we were discussing this earlier. There was a, a business that wanted to partner with bellwether to, to go and sell uh, in, like, into power companies through maintenance departments. Um, and that, that wasn't really like... The, um, the the strength of the model, and so if if there was no like really really strong vision directing it toward now we're, we're really more about the sales forecasting and analysis, like that would have been oh well, here's somebody that wants to do something with us and help us make money sure you know he he might be able to help this product really take off, but it would have been the wrong decision for the business even if it did result in like some short term revenue because it just was the wrong revenue it wasn't strategic, and I think. Um, you know, maybe one final example from commerce, guys, and then I'll, we, can, we can wrap it up and take questions. Um, we have this, this whole commerce kickstart and marketplace idea um, where, where we do have strategic uh, marketplace partners that we integrate into Drupal Commerce um, for the sake of growing their business and then, you know, reaping these, reaping these sort of uh, um, affiliate um, bonuses as, as a result. And, um, you know, whenever you look at all of the people out there providing services to e-commerce companies, there's, there's hundreds of them. 
Um, and so the, the, the real temptation is to say, well, let's just integrate them all and chase them all down and get them all to the table and then put them all into Commerce Kickstart, which then creates a, you know, f- makes for a bloated Commerce Kickstart that's more difficult to maintain and doesn't actually have any long-term impact on your profitability. Like you, you have to have some, some vision and, and some rubric that, that allows you to say no to these 200 companies, yes to these three, and then you know, actually find the relationships and the, and the path forward that works. Um, so vision values, there's books about that as well. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a very healthy and necessary exercise. Excellent. Thank you, Ryan. And I don't need my closing so slides. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to keep this slide up, and then we're going to take questions. We have 10 minutes left. Um, yeah. Hi. Um, I did this presentation last year, well, something similar last year, um, uh, about Drupal and startups. And one of the key questions that people asked me was like, so but wh- what modules should I use? And, and uh, I thought a lot about that. <laughs> and I'm, I've actually I've started putting together uh, a, a Udemy course that's going to answer that and a few other things. So it's like Drupal um, for startups and like prototyping with Drupal. And I'm going to be handing out flyers for that. So if you want uh, something about that, just take All one right. of the Thanks, flyers. Thanks, Krista. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and, and while it's on my mind, I didn't mention earlier, but th- if, if you don't have the kind of services company that can incubate and spin out a product, um, there may actually be companies exhibiting in the hall that have programs to do that sort of thing. Um, so I, I know that Acqui announced earlier this year that they're doing that, that sort of a, a program within, you know, kind of Dries' Octo sort of beast. Um, and then I, and you can also look at the example of like a webform.com, which was essentially spun out of Lullabot through Nate Haug. So they're, you know, you know, becoming a, a, a profit machine in your own strength is not the only path toward doing that. So. Yeah. What would you say about building a business for the sake of getting acquired, like getting acquired by Pantheon or Acquia or Drupal Commerce or the Commerce guys? Like, would you say, like, should you first start producing value or should you talk with those people that you might want to get acquired by to see what you actually should build? I can take that r- real quick. And this yeah. is... Um, so when people ask me questions like that, I usually answer with, actually, the only way to answer that question is to answer, what do you want to do with your life? <laughs> Which we do not have time for. But I think that's really what it comes down to. It, it comes down to uh, your, back to this slide, what is your vision uh, for the company? What is the, what is the goal you have personally for, for the business? Uh, and, then, and then when you can answer that, you can work backwards from there in terms of the right path to, to uh, build your business, whether it's joining forces and being acquired eventually, whether it's going public, whether it's being independent forever as a, as a kind of, I, I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but a lifestyle business. Lifestyle businesses are great. Mission Bicycle is a lifestyle business. It, I think when, you, know, you have to start there to really answer that question. But, it, but I don't think it's bad to have that goal in mind. Like yeah, you know, exactly. building, building a business to, to have an exit is actually like a pretty legitimate strategy. Absol- so. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't, I didn't see AOL going to uh, Verizon coming. But. <laughs> So, so building a product on an open source framework like Drupal, how do you think that changes the evaluation when you're talking to VCs? And then does that have an effect on an exit? So when you're trying to sell it, because it does have sort of an open source framework as the kernel of the product. That's a good point, yeah. Um, so yeah, th- th- there is a slight challenge in the sense that the software you're building everything on um, is not like privately owned, you know, intellectual property, I guess. Right. I mean, it's, it's kind of public domain in a sense. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, uh, like a, a business li- like ours is not usually valued, I don't think, you know, for its, uh, you know, for the license of its code. Um, you know, if you can, you can build a great business on open source software that has fantastic revenue, and that's what, what really matters in long-term client relationships and so on. Um, you know, with, with Commerce Guy specifically, we, we've never really had an issue. Um, you know, of course, our business was built around Drupal Commerce and Commerce Kickstart, but then you come into like a platform.sh and that's not open source. The code behind that is proprietary, um, and that in intellectual property is valuable on its own. But even so, like, just because that is like privately owned intellectual property, like, we, we couldn't necessarily just go sell it because it is something that we can sell. Uh, it still has to be a business that makes sense for somebody to, to get, and it, that's going to come back to, well, how many customers do you have? What's the lifetime value? What's the acquisition cost? And so on. Um, 
So I, I haven't seen it to be a problem, um, but, it, but it will change the kind of business that you're build it, building. So. And Note Squirrel is a great example. I mean, it was just a GPL module that added value, and then what was sold was that, that value and, and that yeah, experience. So the automaker, uh, John DeLorean, wrote about setting goals, and he uh, envisioned a high jumper who claimed uh, he would train to the point where he could jump 30 feet in the air. And uh, he I works and that. works. Works and works and works, and he ends up jumping 20 feet and uh, obtaining the world record, but coming, you know, far short of his goal. So, you know, was he a success or a failure, you know? And it's like when you talk about, you know, Pantheon, if Pantheon said, you know, we want to host 1% of the world's websites, that would sound like a very ambitious goal to me, but obviously it's much smaller than your goal. So how do you know how far to shoot when you're shooting for the moon? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, well, so, and I, and I think this, the same question applies to anyone doing a venture tech, uh, sorry, venture backed startup. Because again, it's back to like, uh, if you're going to really do this, you really are going to have to shoot for the moon. It, that's the reason to raise venture capital. Uh, and there's this uh, kind of duality where on one side of your, your brain, you have to be incredibly rational uh, and not diluted. Uh, and tactical and strategic, and on the other side of your, your brain, you have to you have to shoot for the moon and be crazy. <laughs> and how do you deal with that duality? Uh, and I don't uh, I don't have an answer other than you have to do it. Like you have to be able to flip between both sides of your brain, which is what is most important to do now, uh, what is going to work now, what is the strategy now, what isn't working, and and then you know back to well, if we were to do this and this and this within three years, five years, 10 years, how are we gonna position ourselves in this company to hit the 30 foot high jump? Um, and I think you need to, you, you know, you have to, you can't lie to yourself, right? You have to actually um, believe that it's possible to go down a path where you could run 30% of the web or hit a 30 foot high jump or whatever this goal is. Even if that, the chances of achieving it are very small, if it's, if it's believable and you believe it's possible, then you, you know, it's a, it's a viable goal. Hey, I, I love the uh, I love the example of um, uh, of the bellwether and I, and and uh, and bootstrapping a startup from 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 nowhere, you know, or from you know out of an existing you know an, an existing services company. And I like the experience canvas, and I've I've used that myself. But I think you know I'm I'm always curious when I hear people talk about this, you know, about the experience canvas, and you know, because I feel that there's a gap in it, you know. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, you, you had an epiphany moment, right, with Bellwether where, where you're in a, uh, the middle of a services kind of, or you're connected with somebody who's performing services for a type of a customer, and you know that there's a need there. You know that somebody's doing something wrong, right? But a lot of the great ideas and the great companies come out of an idea that just didn't exist before at all. And there's nothing in Lean that really covers that, you know. Lean doesn't let you make Twitter because nobody needed tweets, you know, before Twitter. So how do you, you know, when you're, when you're trying to think of like ideas in that vein, what do you see, it, is there something that fills that gap for you mm -hmm. for like, you know, Wait, ideation? Uh, I'm, I'm presently maybe a, a bit boring in that, like I, I kind of feel like I need to make some money first before I can afford myself the luxury to <laughs> create something new. Um, and it, but it's it's really just a, a personal decision. I, I I couldn't speak to that directly, but there's a book called Zero to One. Have you heard of it? No, I have not. Okay, so Zero to One is specifically about that question. How how do you like like yeah like like there are already a hundred companies delivering analytics services to power companies, and Bellwether is just like another one that does it a little bit better. Um, but Zero to One is about going from there being no Facebook to there being a Facebook, or there being no Twitter to there being a Twitter. And um, I, I can't remember, is that Horowitz that wrote that? or Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel, my bad. Awesome. Um, yeah, well, so that's, that's go check that out. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if you have a... Uh, one more note. I, I definitely think the lean uh, customer development approach, uh, sorry, the customer development approach is really about enterprise startups. I don't know or I've never tried to apply it to a consumer startup for exactly that reason. Um, I think you could in, in parts, but I think it has a lot more applicability at, at an enterprise startup. Cool. Thank you. Uh, my question uh, is around something I think you addressed a little bit already in talking about sort of like building an agency and, and working into the budget that new startup and like what your profit margins have to be to, to, to start that. Do you have any additional comments and sort of the wisdom or the folly of like trying to do both of these simultaneously? 
launching a, uh, an agency and at the same time trying to have a sort of side business? So for, for you, I have a special slide. Um, <laughs> So uh, this is this fellow is James Lindenbaum. Um, he's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, he was our first advisor and investor at, at Pantheon. First one really outside of the company really believed in us. So he's also the founder, co-founder of Heroku, uh, and achieved great like real success there. Uh, and uh, you know it, it, he was a very early advisor. So I like sent him a cold email, and got in touch with him, and you know convinced him to, to go out to coffee with me. Uh, and we got coffee, and he gave me really good advice. And then I got Josh and Matt and David together. We, we took out to a really nice restaurant, Delfina, in San Francisco. And we got really great advice from James. It was amazing. And her, you know, Heroku at the time, was pre-acquisition, was doing really, really well. And we leave the restaurant, and he turns to all of us and says, and, and so the backstory for him is he actually, they, they spun Heroku out of a consulting company hmm. called Bitscribe. Uh, and uh, it had a very similar path. So he turns to us and says, are you guys going to start this Pantheon company or what? Because if you're going to start this Pantheon company, you'd fire yourselves from Chapter 3 and really do it. And we were like, like are kind of stunned and look at each other. He's like, he is totally right. Uh, and so that's what we ended up doing. We actually decided if we're really going to do this, we're really going to do it. And we, we didn't fire ourselves overnight, but we set up a plan in place where we would extricate ourselves from responsibilities at Chapter 3. Uh, and commensurately, a, a management team at Chapter 3 took over the business. And so they, they run it today. It's very hard. It's... it's uh, it's very challenging. 